This video will introduce the idea of an architecture with components deployed in containers. Why should we use it and how does it work? So the idea behind a component based architecture is that we develop components that live in containers. A component is a piece of code, um, for example a class and it focuses only on the application's functional requirements, uh, things that are unique for the particular application. It has nothing to do with infrastructure code, non-functional requirements that are similar for different applications, like for example uh, security or networking or uh, thread management. The component should not be concerned with such things, but only with functional requirements, the application-specific code. The container, on the other hand, uh, solves the application's non-functional requirements like those I mentioned, networking, thread management, transaction security and, and so on. The container is a framework that manages this. The developer of the application or, or only has to develop the component that lives in the container. So therefore the container can be reused between different applications. Only the application specific code of the component is developed for each application. Of course, we can see advantages of this in terms of code reuse, but still let me emphasize the most important advantages of a component-based architecture. If we did not use the existing framework, it, it would mean that we have to write new code, of course, rewrite the functionality that the framework provides. When I say the framework here, I mean the container. And of course, developing new code takes time and introduces new bugs. So also, uh, when reusing an existing framework, an existing container, we don't need in-house expertise. In the, the project team does not need uh, to have members who, who can uh, write code handling uh, transactions or security, for example, which is quite complicated. It's enough to have people in the project who can handle containers taking care of these requirements. Also, uh, existing frameworks are, are much tested and uh, proven to work well. Uh, of course, there might be frameworks and containers that are not much tested, but no reason to use those because there are frameworks that are thoroughly tested and frequently used. If we are using frameworks that are much used, it is easy to get help. So also, uh, if we were to write the code of the container ourselves, replacing the container, we would have to write not only more code, but also code that is difficult to develop. The non-functional requirements are complicated to code and complicated to debug. So one might say, yeah, of course we reuse existing code, why should we not? So the thing is, and the argument frequently heard, is that many of the containers and frameworks might be difficult to learn, difficult to grasp how they work at first. For example, you see in JPA compared to JDBC, and you might think that JPA is complicated. But the thing is, coding the functionality is practically always more complicated. You end up spending a lot of time developing this code that already existed in the framework. I'm not saying that at all costs you should always use a framework instead of writing code yourself. There might be situations where it's better to develop your own code. What I'm saying is that the complexity of the framework, the time it takes to learn it, is very seldom an issue that um, decides whether you should use the framework or not. So last, before we switch to talking about how to use a component architecture, it's also important to understand the callback style of a framework or container as opposed to the component calling an API. So to explain this, I've drawn an image. In the diagram to the left, to the left of the green line, there is a component in red which calls an API in black. Here it is the component that must know when to call the API. Uh, on the other hand, in the this image to the right of the green line, we have a component in red, again, living inside a container in blue, the framework. So while in the image to the left, it is the component that has the main method. In the image to the right, is it, it is the container that has the main method. Or, or instead of main, both could receive a network call, for example. But here it is the container that calls the component. So the component now only needs to know about application-specific code. When called and the component does not know when it is called, it performs the application-specific code. But on this image to the left, it is the component that must know have the flow control. So the application developer writing the application-specific code must know when to make a security check, for example, when to start a transaction or such things. But here, 
the compa- container makes the security checks or starts transactions or whatever before calling the component. And then the component only executes exactly like application specific code returns into the container that again can do whatever non-functional requirements are needed. How does a component based architecture work then? Well, as uh, we've already seen, the component is just the building block of the application uh, that contains some uh, manageable uh, chunk of code, uh, often a class. Um, for example, a pricing component or a billing component, some application specific code and it lives inside a container. The container provides a context to the component, the the environment in which the component exists. And it uh, manages the components, instantiates them when they are to perform application-specific code, calls them and glues them together by calling the appropriate component at the appropriate time. How the container can know when to call the component, uh, that we will soon see. So it is the container that manages the life cycle of the component. So uh, containers live in an application server and an application server provides the uh, runtime environment for the container. We just start the application server and thereby we start also all the containers. Some commonly used uh, application servers for Spring applications are Tomcat that we will be using in the sample application and uh, Jetty. So these two use blocking TCP sockets. They use the solution that we implemented in homework one. Then there's also, for example, Netty and Undertow that use non-blocking TCP sockets. They work as the application we developed in homework two. Uh, Then just to mention, uh, there are of course many other alternatives Beside Spring application servers, we might use some completely different technology. And just to mention a few, okay, and now let's not start a long discussion of whether these are application servers or web servers. I'm just saying that you could write more or less any application in these other technologies. For example, we could use Wildfly or WebSquare and develop in Java EE. That is, we would still be using Java, but not Spring. Uh, we could use Node.js and develop in JavaScript or Apache or Nginx and develop in PHP uh, or we could use Zoop or Django and develop in Python. We also need tools for development and for deployment and the development tool is typically an IDE and some commonly used IDEs for Spring development are Spring Toolsuite which is based on Eclipse and is one of the Spring projects. Another frequently used IDE, well, we can always discuss whether it's an IDE or an editor, but never mind. Atom is frequently used because there's a Spring project providing Spring tools suite as a plugin. Uh, IntelliJ is always frequently used for Java development. And uh, NetBeans used to be frequently used and it was my preferred uh, editor, but currently 2018 it is uh, in transition from Oracle to Apache and therefore it's not really usable now. But with the uh, coming releases, uh, maybe November or February, it should probably be in good shape again. Uh, so why do we need such a development tool? Well, well, an IDE is always appropriate of course, but especially appropriate when using a more complex uh, framework. Uh, and that is because uh, the component must adhere to certain requirements of the container, like implement a certain interface, have certain annotations and configuration files and so on. And an IDE can provide a lot of help. Uh, We also need a deployment tool. The deployment phase means to make the container aware of the component, so the container can instantiate and invoke the component when needed. Here we basically have two choices, you could say. Either we use a long-running application server, we keep the application server running and we use its deployment and management tools to configure and update the application. Uh, That's one alternative. Or the other alternative 
we package the entire application server and its containers and our application and configuration files and everything in one unit and deploy that in for example a cloud environment and then we use that, that cloud environments tools like docker and kubernetes and so on uh, to manage different nodes and we when we want to update our application we spin up a new application server with the new version of the application Okay, but that's really outside this course. In this course we will cheat a bit. So we'll just care about development. We will write the application in an appropriate way, code it. But we don't care about operation. So actually we will do neither of these. We'll just, we will package the application server together with the application and start everything as one unit. But we won't manage runtime environment. We'll just stop the application server and start a new version when we change the application. So of course that's not really appropriate. The application server will go down whenever we make some change. But as I said, operation uh, is not really part of this course. We just uh, focus on development.